this is a this is a really important topic and and um, something that I think as a as physicians we need to think very hard about and as a patient and carer group you also I think need to be part of this debate and this discussion and I'll come to that at the end but this is this is a important topic so as you'll all probably know um, there's been a long process of approval going through uh, the advisory group for national specialist services then referral to NICE and then finally in the early part of this year NICE published its recommendations and I'm sure as all of you are very much aware they, they recommended that ecolizumab was used for the treatment of atypical HUS but they put a few conditions attached to its use so the first was that its uh, treatment is coordinated through a specialist centre which is what we currently provide in Newcastle. There needs to be a monitoring system in place to record the number of people and the diagnoses so that we can actually keep track of it and that's again something that we, we do in Newcastle. That there's a national protocol for starting and stopping ecolizumab and we've developed those so they're available on the internet to physicians. We provide a 24 hour a day on call service that so people can call us. So we, we provide those. And then the final recommendation that there must be, and this is something they've mandated, a research program with robust methods to evaluate when stopping treatment or dose adjustment might occur. They went into a little bit more detail, I'm sorry for all this text, but what they then went on to say is that the research arrangements included, but were not exclusive to, determining which patient characteristics allow safe treatment withdrawal after an initial response, whether the patient's disease responds to retreatment with ecolizumab if a relapse then subsequently occurs, and also whether the drug dose could be titrated to allow use of a lower drug, and also to collect data about patient experience of the relative uh, benefits of being on ecolizumab and, the, and how you would view the risk of withdrawal or the, 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 the concept of withdrawal. So this was something that NICER clearly want us to look at and there are lots of reasons that they want us to look at and I'll talk about a little bit more. There was also, and it, uh, this really reflects that the evidence which, for which ecolizumab got its license for use was relatively slim. There were two studies, we were involved in both of those studies and there was only 36 patients involved in the two studies, 20 in one and 16 in another. And that was across the world. And that was the evidence that the company used to the FDA in America and to the European Medical Agency in Europe to say, look, hey, this works. And it was accepted because it clearly does work and it works very well. But those studies were only for a relatively short period. They only went up to 26 weeks, six months. And with ecolizumab, you know, we could be looking at decades of treatment, not six months of treatment. So there is a need for further evidence on the long-term outcomes of treatments with ecolizumab, the effect of treatment in children, adolescents, and during pregnancy. So Edwin has spoken about the pregnancy issue, and you know this is a very important issue because a lot of people with HUS are young women who want to be thinking about families. So we need to look at that. But also we're thinking, well, children, you know, it could be decades and decades on ecolizumab because the current recommendations are for lifelong treatment. NICE summed up and said, actually, in three years after their initial recommendation, they're going to look at this and they're going to see what the evidence base is in three years' time. And I think they will want to see changes in how we deal with the treatment with ecolizumab. What I'm going to focus on today is that last recommendation about methods to evaluate stopping treatment. Because I think that's really the way we're thinking in Newcastle about how we might want to approach the future. Why should we stop ecolizumab? You've heard from lots of speakers, it works, and I agree, it works, and it works very effectively. But I don't think we can be 100% certain about the long-term safety. There is always that risk of meningococcal infection. That's there. There may be other unexplained side effects, and we've certainly seen that. And we also need to think about special circumstances, and I've already spoken about <coughs> transplantation, where 
it's yet another immunosuppressive drug on top of people who are already immunosuppressed. I mentioned about the burden of treatment uh, in terms of dialysis. You know, Ecoluzumab is intravenous and it's lifelong. And you know, if you're a child where intravenous access is difficult, and it, that can be a major challenge. So there is a burden of treatment. And there's no getting away from this last one. Ecoluzumab is very expensive. And that undoubtedly was one of the drivers behind NICE's recommendation that they want to see this drug used in a cost-effective manner. They didn't dispute that it worked. That was never an issue, really, with the NICE uh, discussions. It was all about cost-effectiveness. And I think we are being mandated to do that. You know, everybody knows that the health service is cash-strapped and it's not a bottomless well. So we do need to look at the, how we can use these new treatments cost-effectively. The risk is if we don't, we may run into problems in the future. So the first thing we have to think is, is it safe? Is it safe to actually withdraw ecoluzumab? And the answer to that is, it's yes, it is safe. And there is evidence coming out, and this is perhaps the, the biggest series. It's only 10 patients, um, but it was a series from Italy of withdrawal of ecoluzumab in 10 patients some of them relapsed, and we have to accept that some people will relapse. But seven in the initial report managed to withdraw from ecoluzumab without relapse. Now, this only reports a short term follow up, so we don't know what's going to happen in the longer term. But certainly in the short term, 70% of patients can withdraw. The other important thing is because these patients were monitored very carefully. Ecluzumab could be reintroduced as soon as there was any <coughs> hint of a relapse. And those patients that relapsed with reintroduction of treatment did very well with complete recovery. The relapses were also only in the three patients, and I think it has changed a little bit since, there have been a couple more, but with factor H, and that should say mutations, I apologize, but it's with factor H mutations, so higher risk people. So even in people with high risk, and there were some people with factor H mutations who did have withdrawal and remained off ecoluzumab, it is possible. So what's our experience in the UK? I mean, because we've been coordinating and collecting data from a large population, we have had patients who've withdrawn from ecoluzumab. Now, there are lots of reasons for withdrawing from ecoluzumab. It could be that it hasn't worked, and so there's no point carrying on. But this is our experience in the UK of people who have got function, their kidneys are working, and they've come off ecoluzumab. So we have four patients who've come off ecoluzumab with normal renal function. When we look at those um, patients, three of them are in that no mutation group, which are probably the low risk category in terms of relapse, and one patient had an MCP mutation. If we look at patients who have a degree of chronic kidney disease, so some kidney disease, not normal function, but not dialysis dependent, six people have withdrawn, five no mutations, one with an MCP, CD46 mutation. Of those, only one patient of those 10 have had to go back onto ecoluzumab. Now, this is a lower risk population than the Italian population, and we've only had 10% of people, one in 10, going back onto on treatment. So this is what we're proposing. And we're just putting the proposals together at the moment. And we're going to run this across the country. It's a national study. It's going to involve multiple centers. People will know. It's not going to be uh, a trial where people don't know what's happening. It'll be open label. It won't be controlled. So we're not going to take a population and some withdraw and some stay on treatment. We just don't have enough people with atypical HUS to do that sort of study. We did try and do it across Europe, but that wasn't successful in terms of funding. And then we're going to see, and the primary question we're asking is about safety. Is it safe to withdraw in these patients? We're probably looking at about 30 or thereabout patients. Lots of discussion going on about should it be all patients, should it be some patients and not others. That's things that we'll need to, to think about. My view is, is that it should be, we should be as inclusive as possible and try and understand more about this whole process. 
No one's going to force anybody to come off ecolizumab. It's only going to be people who give informed consent. So you'll be told all about the study, what's going to happen, and it'll be up to you as to whether or not you come off ecolizumab. We would actually ask, though, as part of this, that if you decide not to come off ecolizumab, we can still keep an eye on you because then we can compare how things are going with you on ecolizumab to those people who've come off ecolizumab. Ecolizumab will be withdrawn, and it'll be withdrawn with very close monitoring. So if any of you have taken part in a drug study before, you'll maybe know how closely people are monitored. And we will very, very carefully monitor people for risk of relapse. And in many ways, I would prefer this, and I know that there are discussions and some people have been withdrawn. I would prefer people to be withdrawn within the trial where we can monitor people very carefully than perhaps in a, in a more sort of ad hoc, uncontrolled manner. We'll do blood tests on a regular basis. We will also get people to monitor themselves. Because if you've got decent kidney function, you don't have blood in your urine. If you relapse with HOS, you'll start to see blood appearing in the urine on dipsticks. Simple tests, which people can do at home themselves. So we can give you a pot of these things, ask you to check your urine on a regular basis, and then more frequently possibly in and around times you might get an infection. So if you get the flu, check it every day. If you're well, check it maybe two or three times a week. And then as soon as you see any changes, come back to us and we can start treatment if necessary. Key that we have the ability to rapidly reintroduce, so the drug would have to be available at your local kidney unit, so as soon as there was any hint of a problem, you go back on the drug. Maybe go back on the drug for a period of time and then come off it again. Because, you know, it could be, you could stop the drug, two years later you get a hint of a relapse, you might just want to go back on the drug for three or six months and then come off again for another few years. Or even a few decades. That's what we don't know. How do we judge safety? How are we going to look at this and say, actually, it is or isn't safe? And so what we'll have to look at is how the kidneys are working before the study starts and then how the kidneys are working at the end of the study to ensure that we've not had any detrimental effect on kidney function. Or indeed, have there been any serious events that have developed whilst people are coming off the drug? And it's very important, though, that we do monitor people who are on the drug against people who are coming off the drug because we need to know what's happening with people who stay on as opposed to the people who come off. Because, we, we've, as I mentioned, it's not totally safe possibly to be on the drug. So this is how we see the trial developing. We hope to start it in the early part of next year if it's funded. And so many of you in the room may well be approached and asked whether you'd be participating in that study. With that in mind, there's a questionnaire that we're going to ask you to fill in if you don't mind about your views about this whole area. Um, we're going to ask you, would you be willing to take part in this type of study? And maybe if you're not, that's not a problem, it's fine. But we'd like to understand why not. What are your concerns? Um, and is there anything specific that we need to address? Even if you're willing to take part in it, what concerns you that we should actually try and address? We're also in this study, there's something called a qualitative part of the research, where we're actually not just going to measure things and measure blood tests. We're going to ask you about your opinion, how you're finding it. Is it better on? Is it better off? And just simply ask those sorts of questions and get your views. And, you know, would you be happy for us to contact you about that? If you are, what's the best way of doing it? Telephone calls, you know, face-to-face -face meetings would be ideal, but everyone's over the country, we're not going to be able to do that. Would you prefer postal questionnaires? So if I could ask, if, and as more information we collect at this stage, the better. If you could fill out one of these forms, I'd be, I'd be really grateful. And that's me done. Thank you. Um, we are a little bit behind on the schedule, so if there are any quick questions. Oh, God, blimey, they were quick questions. Okay. I, I don't know, maybe if we could have a couple of questions then maybe you, to, yeah. people so could speak to you individually yeah, over the yeah, tea break, couldn't awesome. they, if you think it's going to be quite a long one. Yeah, if somebody's been having a cruise lab and they're withdrawn and then they relax, I'm just wondering if There's no reason why they should be more resistant. No. No. There should be no, there should, there's no biological reason 
But of course, this is something we would have to look at as part of the study. But yeah. no, the, 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 the individuals who restarted in Italy were fine again, and there's no reason why they should be resistant. You don't think there'd be more That's why we would need to restart treatment very quickly. Because if you look at the studies, if you start treatment quickly, people do very well. If you delay treatment, and this is the problem that people often don't present until very late when they're almost on that or on dialysis, then yes, there would be damage. If we could start treatment within a day or two of relapse, I would expect that the kidney function should be completely normal at the end. But that's really what we would have to look at. You know, we don't know the answer to that question absolutely, but it we would hope that it would go back to normal. There's time. Um, rather than the stop-start option, is, is, there, is there a third option which where you would extend the, the time to treatment or reduce the amount of the uh, drug? Yes, um, there is. And the Italian group who published the, the studies of withdrawal have also looked at increasing the time between the studies between the doses. It's an option. I don't think it's a great option. And it, the reason I don't think it's a great option is if you start ex lengthening the time between your doses, I think every time you sort of run out, you know, the, the ecclesiomob will cover you for two weeks. That's what the data would suggest. Beyond that two weeks, it starts to lose its effect. It no longer blocks complement. So every time you go much beyond that two-week period, you'd be at risk of a relapse. Now, you might say that's not such a bad thing, but I think what you would have is a situation where you, you know, you'd have these periods of time when you'd be at risk of a relapse. There'd be times when you wouldn't be, but there'd be times when you would be at risk. And I would be concerned about being able to monitor those periods well enough. Uh, and that sort of change of being covered, not being covered, being covered, being co not being covered, might prove very difficult. It's not a non, it's not a, it is one option, and as it's an option that's been addressed by other people as well. What would be great is if we had a biological test to say, yes, you are protected, no, you're not protected. There are, Sorry? There are some laboratories, and uh, I know in the USA, Boston, and since uh, 12, in Netherlands as well, who can do these tests, and who can show whether the There is. Um, you can measure the, the Boston offers levels of ecolizumab, so you can measure the levels of ecolizumab. There is a, a group in Italy which suggests they've got a much more effective biological way of measuring complement activation, but it's not one that would be readily usable um, just because of the way it's set up. So there are potentially ways of knowing whether you're protected or not. Um, and it might allow re dose reduction and dose elongation. I I don't think that would be easy to implement. The, the reason I say that is what we're going to try and really set up is something that can work in a clinical trial, but then it has to be able to work in the real world as well. And if we set up something that can be done as very much as a research program with lots of things happening that's only available in the research world, we set up a study that is only applicable in the context of a clinical trial and not generalizable beyond that clinical trial. So we have to be slightly careful.